towards the eyes and pull like a dog. <laughs> and a new Irish record for Phil Healy, 22.99. Christy Cooney hands over the Sam Maguire Cup to Graham Canty, Cork All-Ireland Champions for the seventh time ever. Hello and welcome to the Star Sport Podcast. My name is Jack McCarran of the Southern Star and I'm joined as always by Star Sport Editor Kieran McCarthy. Before we kick things off, I'd just like to give a gentle reminder to our listeners and viewers to please rate, review and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Coming up on today's show, we're catching up with Skibreen rowing sensations Jake and Finton McCarthy. World champion Finton and twin brother Jake, a world rowing finalist in his own right, both had their sights set on securing a seat in the Irish lightweight double at last year's Tokyo Olympics before the pandemic put those ambitions on hold. Both brothers now have to reschedule games firmly in their sights and in a few minutes we'll hear what they had to say when they caught up with Kieran. Later in the week, we'll be releasing another podcast which will be a special tribute episode to the late great Eamon Ryan who sadly passed away last week. We'll be joined by Cork legends Rena Buckley and Nulla Cleary to remember the great man so keep an eye out for that one on Wednesday. And now Kieran, before we hear from the McCarthys, I might just get your thoughts on Sunday's Premier League action between your beloved Manchester United and a floundering Liverpool. What did you make of the nil-all draw? Were you happy with the result in the end? I had taken a draw before him, Jack, because like we all know from listening to Liverpool fans over the last 18 months, this is probably the greatest Liverpool team of all time, probably the greatest football team of all time. And that's not doing a disservice to some of the, the great international sides. But if you listen to Liverpool fans on Twitter, this Liverpool team is just a cut above the rest. But um, I think you've come back down there to small within the last, I suppose, the last couple of months. But to be fair, Jack, a nil-all draw was probably a fair result. Um, it wasn't the worst in all draw out there kind of there was a couple of chances in the second half but usually with these big games they never live up they, or they rarely live up to the to the pre-match billing I think United will be happy to take the point that keeps them top um, I think Liverpool have more worries than United to be quite honest because for United are now no one thought that they would be there no one thinks they would be there at the end of the season but Liverpool are obviously the reigning champions they are one of the real title favourites along with Man City so I'd be more concerned with Liverpool. As, 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 if I was a Liverpool fan, I'd be more concerned with their form rather than United because I think United will tail off at some point. But I think there's Liverpool just aren't flowing. The spark isn't there as it was last season, Jack. I don't know, as a Liverpool fan, if you agree with that, but it's just not clicking for Liverpool right now. Yeah, well, I think Ken Early had a good piece on the Irish Times this morning and he was just kind of going through how big an impact the loss of Virgil van Dijk has had because it feeds into Fabinho and Henderson being taken out in midfield. And I think as well, just watching the game yesterday, it's so frustrating. Liverpool's over-reliance on these crossfield diags from uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold Arnold even to Robertson and back again. And every time they start an attack, they launch one of these balls left to right or right to left. And it's just so repetitive. And the United fullbacks yesterday, wan and Luke Shaw, had the measure of Mane and Salah. So Liverpool needed to try and change it up a bit and try and play through the middle but they just never really did it was just left to right right to left left to right right to left and it was frustrating to watch they seem to be missing I don't know just missing that cutting edge which is amazing really to say when they had their tr- their their front three the, the, the Mane, Salah and Firmino trio all starting but they just seem to be missing and I think a big part of it is the fact that Henderson and Fabinho are playing centre half as opposed to up in midfield where they can you know Break down and some wonder, of the United uh, counterattacks. I wonder too, Jack, and Liverpool missing Diego Yata. He's obviously injured because you look at Mane, uh, Firmino, and Salah, like obviously unsung, probably the, the best front three in Europe. Like they're sensational, but they're not. They're not on, on, on top form this season. I think kind of. I know Salah. Salah's been. He's on a kind of a, a drought at the moment, but he had what had eighty twelve or thirteen goals before that. Firmino, I've never been convinced of, but. When you have those three and they're starting every game, Riata injured and that competition for places, you could see yesterday they just weren't clicking as like as as they have in in the past. So I just wonder um, for for Liverpool for the rest of the season, are they good enough to win the league? Of course they are. Are they playing well enough to win the league? No, not right now. But I think on the flip side for for United, 
I've been saying for a while, they're chog- chugging along in third gear, and they are. They haven't hit top, top form. There's a lot of room for improvement for this United team over the next 6, 12, 18 months. They left some big chances behind them yesterday. They have a lot of players who are not playing quite well at the moment. I'm thinking of Bruno Fernandes wasn't great again yesterday. He wasn't great against Burnley. Um, Rashford hasn't been impressive the last couple of games. Martial is more cold than hot. So from a United fan's perspective, there is definitely room for improvement. So I take me top of the table in January right now. Okay, well, let's just touch on one more Premier League story then, Kieran. before we hear from the May. The McCarthy twins, and that is the imminent transfer of Bandon's Connor Howrahan. He's still at Aston Villa at the time of recording, but there seems to be a lot of interest from him and it, from clubs who are sitting pretty near the top of the championship. Yeah, we wrote about Connor a couple of weeks ago in the Southern Star just about his, his lack of minutes with Aston Villa this season. He hasn't appeared for Villa since November 30th when he started in their last um, away to West Ham. And since then, he's been on the bench and he hasn't got a look in. So he's on the periphery at Villa at the moment. Um, they're just looking at different options. Obviously, Ross Barkley came in in, in the summer. Um, even though he's been injured at the moment, Barkley starts to hit a horn when he's fit. And there's so many midfield options for Villa at the moment for Connor has just found himself on the outside looking in. So like you said, Jack, there's clubs looking at him. Swansea, Bournemouth, Middlesbrough, there are three clubs who've been credited with real interest in signing Connor on loan this month. And that's probably the best option for him now because he needs to play football. He needs minutes. Um, not playing any minutes since the end of November isn't ideal for Connor, especially if he wants to keep his place in the Ireland team too, which is very important to him. Ireland have their started their World Cup qualification in March, I think. So Connor needs to be playing football to be to be in position to play for Ireland. Um, a loan deal probably looks the most likely option right now because Villa probably don't want to sell him this window because you never know what's around the corner. And I think Connor's proved himself at Villa over the years. I think he's 30 goals and 150 appearances. And he played such a, a crucial part in their promotion to the Premier League. Um, he featured heavily last season for Villa too. But as we know, there's no room for sentiments at the top level of professional football. Villa want to kick on. They want to push for European spots this season. And they're, they're going quite well. And it just seems at the moment Connor isn't part of the picture so that's why probably for all parties a lone move for the second half of the season is probably what's right for Connor right now and the fact that the three clubs you mentioned Swansea, Bournemouth and Middlesbrough are all in to hunt for promotion to the Premier League makes it an even more attractive proposition because if Connor signs with one of those three clubs and leads them to the promised land it will just further enhance his reputation you'd much rather see him join a club fighting for promotion than a club in mid-table or a club battling against relegation. So the best luck to Connor with whatever he chooses to do. Now, Kieran, let's move on to our main feature of this week's podcast, and that's your conversation with Jake and Finton McCarthy. We're going to hear it in just a minute, but maybe just give the listeners a flavour of what they can expect and how the lads were when you spoke to them over the weekend. Um, we're less than 190 days out now from the Olympic Games um, that were postponed back in the summer of 2020 and, and are set to go ahead this summer in Tokyo Touchwood. Um, the noises from Tokyo are more encouraging the last week or so about the Games because at the start of the year there had been some noise, oh, will they go ahead, won't they go ahead? But it seems like they look like they will go ahead, but there will be obviously be a lot of restrictions around it. They're going to cut the number of athletes who can attend the the opening ceremony when it comes to the Olympic Village. As soon as you're finished your, um, as soon as you're finished your event, you have to leave the village. Um, okay, athletes will get miss, miss out on the Olympic experience like it has been for for so so long. But as athletes, they just want to compete at the Olympic Games. And Bill Healy was an after ball a couple of weeks ago, and she said an, an Olympics is an Olympics. You know, kind of she wants to kind of compete against the best, and it's the same for for the rowers. So. Just a bit of context too on Jake and Finton. They're twins from Affadown, which is a parish just outside Skibbereen. That's the same parish that has given us Gary and Paul O'Donovan. Those two sets of brothers, Gary and Paul and Jake and Finton, are the four who are in competi- competition for the two seats in the Irish lightweight double that has qualified for the Games. When it qualified, Paul and Finton were the two men in the boat that qualified the boat. The selection process has been opened up again and we'll know quite soon who Rowing Ireland will pick as their selection for the international season ahead. 
So in the mix, you have Paul O'Donovan, world champion rower, Gary O'Donovan, who won an Olympic medal with Paul back in 2016. Then you've Fintan McCarthy, who's a world champion rower, and you've Jake, who's a very, very talented rower as well. Shane O'Driscoll, another skipper in rower, was in the mix, but he's not in the mix anymore. He's gone down a different route. So it's basically from this four, the Irish lightweight double will be picked. As you'll hear from the chat coming up here quite soon, Jake had an injury last year, which has put him in the back foot. And anyone who knows anything about sport and rowing, um, if, if you miss any chunk of time, it, it just sets you back an awful lot. So Jake, to be honest, is playing catch up to force his way into the Irish board. So from that, I'm thinking it's between Gary Paul and Finton. That's where you're looking at right now um, to get into Irish lightweight double. That's not to rule Jake out. Of course, he's a chance. He's a very, very talented rower. But like I said, he has that ground to make up and he's missed a large chunk of training. So we'll have to wait and see. So um, the lads are in great form. They're in great form. Um, we've had them on the podcast before and they were really good fun and they were they, they were great crack here again. I have to say, Finton has been my Netflix man over the last 12 months since I've been introduced to Netflix. He's the fellow I'd touch base with to say, any recommendations, anything I can watch now. Um, he's a great man for Netflix. So um, he gives us a Netflix recommendations here again, which is always good to get. So there are two brothers with a very, very big year ahead of them. We wish them the very best of luck. And when I caught up with them on Saturday night, they were in top form. Delighted to be joined on the podcast this week by two Skipping Rowing Club's most famous rowing brothers, Jake and Finton McCarthy. Welcome to the podcast again, lads. Cheers, thanks for having me on. We're in the middle of lockdown three now. Um, obviously, we'd lockdown one and lockdown two last year. Jake, for ye as, as athletes, how do you differentiate between the, the three lockdowns? Was one worse than the other? How does lockdown three compare to two and one? Um, well, I suppose the first lockdown we had it was like complete shutdown of the country you know so um the rowing center actually closed and no one was able to go there so everyone kind of had to do their work from home essentially and uh we kind of just we were lucky enough to grab i think we got like an erg and a few weights there from um the club and stuff and everyone kind of did that and so we could like work away from home so i suppose that was the biggest difference because in this one now we're kind of exempt as elite athletes and we can actually train in that facility which to be honest is actually like probably better than most people you know because we can actually go out and obviously with the restrictions but uh we have some interaction with other people you know um but i'd say that's probably the biggest difference yeah so it is a bit easier i think this one than the definitely than the first one what a silver lining fintan to one of the earlier lockdowns is the fact you got to spend more time at home kind of like you're, you're back on, on the River Island a lot more than you maybe would have been in a normal year. You would have, you would have been up at the National Rowing Centre practically full time. So for a stage of 2020, you are back down, based at home, back in the island, back in the club, like obviously following the restrictions, but you are yeah. back where it all started. Yeah, yeah, it was like old times there for a while. Um, we had we had a, a big stretch where we couldn't go to the club at all. Um, so that was just kind of you know, doing the rowing machine in the garage kind of thing. But then I think it was around May or June, we got to um, use the boathouse. We weren't allowed training indoors at the club, but we could um, kind of go into the boathouse one by one and get back out on the river. So that was really nice, you know, being able to, you know, train where it all started for a few weeks. Jake was saying there that you're back in the National Rowing Centre now. You could, like, as, as elite athletes, you have that exemption. Are you based down home in, in, in Skibbereen or where are you based at the moment? No, we're actually based in Ovens at the moment, so it's only 10 or 15 minutes away from the rowing centre. So we just go between home and uh, the rowing centre during the day. And that's our And how many fights? How, how many fights every day, every week you have? And because I presume you're seeing a lot more of each other now than ever before. And like, like all of us, we're not getting to see a lot of other people. So are, are you seeing too much of each other? How, how How is that whole dynamic going at the moment? Yeah, well, I guess we're, like, firstly, we're kind of used to it anyway. And, like, I'd say regardless of the situation, we'd be having uh, regular kind of fights anyway. But I suppose, yeah, it is different that we're kind of not seeing our friends and stuff like we usually would. And you would kind of get a bit of cabin fever sometimes. But I think, like, I suppose it's good that we can, you know, we have FaceTime and Zoom and that kind of thing. Um, and you can like go away and dream even 
and just Escape you know just the... see it like even virtually other people and stuff like that which is i suppose the best next best alternative so yeah it's kind of different that way i reckon we've grown up a bit as well we don't fight that much anymore <laughs> and and as well as roars because we we talked before like you dedicate so much time and effort to 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 rowing um how different is life kind of before covid and during covid for you in terms of you're still getting to train you still dedicate so much of, of your week to 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 rowing so is, is there much of a change in that sense yeah not really ever since we've come back now it's pretty much our usual day like we don't really go and see much of anyone anyway so it's like we might get a trip to the shop once a week so it's pretty much normal um obviously you know it'd be nice to have time to go and see friends and stuff but we don't get much time to do that anyway so it is kind of normal for us bar those you know one or two odd occasions potentially two lads this could be quite a big year touch road the olympics which were postponed back in the summer of 2020 will go ahead in tokyo this year um obviously the I suppose the interesting story about the two of you and gary and paul donovan is that there's four rowers competing for those two spots in the irish lightweight double that is it that is going to tokyo so looking at the olympics first we've obviously just it's been in the news the last couple of weeks like will it go ahead will it be postponed what's going to happen um the noises seem to be encouraging from Tokyo that the games will go ahead. So what, what's your own thoughts first? I presume you obviously want the games to go ahead this summer. Yeah, 100%. So that's what we've been working towards for the last few years now. Um, it's, I think, yeah, we're just treating it as if it's going ahead and training towards that. So we haven't really thought much about much else, really. So, yeah, we're just kind of training away as if, as if everything's normal and we're going to be racing in July. So, And let's say it's a case so, lads, that the games are going ahead, but they're not the games as we know them, maybe without fans or whatever, but you might have to go out six weeks beforehand. You might have to get the, the vaccine. Is that something that, like, as athletes, you'll do whatever you have to do to get to compete in the games? Um, I guess so. Like, if it's kind of do or die a situation, then I suppose you kind of, like, after dedicating so many years, I suppose, of your life, you kind of would have to, like, there will be a bit of concern in the back of your mind um, of the long-term, like, effects that maybe the vaccine could have, but I'd say there's a lot of, kind of, finan- like, research that's gone into it. Um, so I'd say you'd probably be safe in, on that front, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say I'll be getting no matter what, anyway, if we can. <laughs> and to kind of, before we chat more about the Olympics, um, the fact that obviously they should have been here last year, they weren't. It's a year, a year down the road. For for the two of you, you're still only 24. Like you're still so young. And remember, we talked before Finton at, at some stage in 2020 about that extra year could be quite crucial to you in terms of improving, you know, technique, getting fitter, faster, stronger, better rowers. So, was it important for you to make the most out of that extra 12 months? Um. Yeah, I think. Like, when I spoke to you about it then, I was probably uh, thinking, oh, I'm going to do a great 12 months and get loads faster. But I think I used it well and kind of, you know, got the experience that, um, you know, maybe I was lacking before. So went to Europeans and did some racing, which, you know, just an extra regatta behind me to learn some things. Um, Obviously, Jake had the injury, so... It wasn't as as mm, as great as productive for him, <laughs> but yeah, I think um, you kind of with. I think it was the same in lockdown for everyone. In that you just did what you could, um, and that was that was the best you could do, really. Yeah. Injury wise, Jake, how are you now? Um, I'm a lot better than I was ten months ago. Um, but it's kind of been a really slow one. The injury is, to be honest, is quite notorious for being a slow healer. So, like, basically, I herniate a disc in my lower back, um, so it kind of bulges out and presses onto the nerve. So I've had, like, neural kind of pain down my leg for quite a while now, um, which was, like, 
tough to be honest like probably one of the toughest parts of my life so far just not only because you know you can do the training and stuff but it was also pretty debilitating as well you know like even walking just getting up sitting down that kind of thing um but like thank god i'm i'm kind of a lot better now and i've been introducing some bit of rowing and so that's kind of been positive yeah given that the injury happened in a year for the olympics war pushback yeah has it has it increased your I suppose, like, the positivity in your mind to think, okay, I get back at some stage and try and mm-hmm. fight for that position in the boat. Like, if the Olympics yeah. would have hit last year, obviously, it wouldn't have worked out for you. No, definitely not. Like, it was kind of a blessing in disguise on that front um, when it did happen. But back then, I was kind of like, oh, I'll be better in a couple of months anyway and I can get back into training, you know. But it's actually only been the last couple of weeks that I've been able to get back into, like, uh, proper decent training. Um, so it took a lot longer than expected, but again, I would have been had no Olympics, like even not the ch- even the chance of trial, um, if it did go ahead last year. So it's definitely a positive in relation to that, and hopefully now maybe in the next few weeks I can get motoring, and I guess we'll just see what happens. Do you feel so, Jake, to an extent that you're playing catch up with the other uh, rowers in the Irish lightweight group because it's mm-hmm. so competitive that boat? Like we're talking about, yeah champion rowers the best of the best I like to call it like it's like Top Gun it's the Top Gun of rowing it's the elite <laughs> rowers who are who are fighting for for these two seats in the boat like you mentioned yeah. Gary and Paul Donovan obviously Finton beside you so you have a bit of room to kind of catch up with these lads for the trials mm-hmm. and to push, put yourself in the reckoning yeah it's definitely going to be more of an obstacle and, um, as well but I think Gary said it before it's like whoever um making the lightweight double for Ireland it like would maybe even be harder than winning a medal in the world championships you know because it is so competitive um but I think you know I'll have to just try and row better maybe because I'm not gonna be probably as good physiologically you know because I've had so much time out um but hopefully I can kind of get an advantage in other areas and um yeah push on that way Talk to me for a second, Fintan, about this competition of places in the boat. Um, Shane O'Driscoll's not involved I- anymore at, at this level in terms of he's not in the mix for the Irish lightweight double. So there's your, yourself and Jake and there's Gary and Paul. Is there any more kind of outliers, kind of someone from, from left the field who might put their name in the mix? Or is it from this group of four that the, the two is going to come? Yeah, I don't think there's anyone at the moment... Uh... Well, I mean, there's not anyone at the moment. It's just the four of us, really. Just training away for that, so. And what's that like? It's, it's, it's two sets of brothers from the same parish of Affidown who row with the same club, um, who've known each other for years, battling for those two seats in the boat. What's that competition been like, especially coming into the year that it is? Because the Olympics now is less than 190 days away. It's, I think it's 27 weeks, you know, kind of. We're getting to that stage now where you can almost start to touch it and talk about it, like touch what it does mm. go ahead. So what's that competition like? Um, I think we're all pretty used to it now. Like it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like the games are so, so close. I think probably just because, you know, last year we were counting down the days like, like you were there at this stage. And then it's been a whole year since then. They still haven't happened. So yeah, they still do feel a bit far away and there is a few little few more boxes to tick before the boat gets picked so I don't think any of us are really thinking of you know the competition aspect of it at the moment we're all just training away trying to make ourselves better and then later on in the year we'll just do some racing and whoever's the fastest will be in it so that's what's kind of that's the situation at the moment I don't think there's any big like um, competitive atmosphere and thing. We're all just training really hard, trying to make ourselves and each other better. So, um, the, the process so for trials and so on has that been laid out for you? Kind of what's going to happen over the next couple of months in terms of selection? Um, it'll just be kind of the usual what we do every year. Um, just racing against each other, uh, swapping around in the boats for training, kind of stuff like that. Um, so we had nothing different to to normal really I think um, I'm not even sure when the final decision's going to be made I think maybe um, March or April is our first race but then again it could be changed after the 
the racing as well. So we don't we don't really know. Jake, um, you like you said, you're you're back training now, but I suppose this winter, this block of training for all the rowers, the elite rowers, it's been so different because usually yeah. you might head away to Seville or you go go on a different kind of camps abroad. Everything's been done at home this year. So how different has that been without without being able to go and top up the ten? You've had to bear the Irish cold winter for the first time in the year. So you've yeah. seen what the rest of us have suffered through. So what's 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 happened? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, it's definitely a lot different. Um I was kind of I suppose not happy but that you know, everyone was in the same boat, uh, in that even though I was injured, like no one was going on camp anyway, you know, so I wasn't missing out there. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of been changed. But I suppose we've had a change of atmosphere as well because we've kind of been training at home and then back up here. Like it hasn't been, I suppose, one block or one stint for a long period of time in one place. Um, but I was kind of, I was doing a bit of swimming as well as some cross training. Um, so I was kind of mixing it up that way, you know, because that was one of the things I was actually able to do without much pain um so that was different as well um which helped i suppose the, the, the monotony of it all yeah when you get home so like you said you're up at ovens at the moment um you, you train maybe 11 12 13 times a week i'm not sure what a normal training week looks for you right now how do you switch off when you get home so kind of what do you do kind of just to just to turn off from rowing for for a couple of hours at least I think you know my answer to that already. You're in <laughs> the Netflix. It's, uh, that's the main form of entertainment these days. Jake, it's my go-to person. Oh, sorry, Finn, it's my go-to person for Netflix because, <laughs> we were, we, I, I, like I said, we were talking at some stage last year, I hadn't even joined Netflix or hadn't even subscribed to Netflix and I'd heard it all about <laughs> it in the background. So I'm still working my way through. I'm so far behind so, everyone else. It's, it, it's embarrassing. To be honest, I'm so far behind. But... What are your recommendations? So I go to you first, Fintan. Um, what's your recommendation? So what's something good to watch on Netflix? Um, well, I've already told you about Breaking Bad. That's a, a must watch, really. Um, there's there's so much on there, but Breaking Bad is the the first one to take off the list, anyway. I'd say. Yeah. I. I, I I wouldn't watch loads of Netflix, but um, I don't know you. You might have heard, you might have seen it already. The Sopranos series, that's like one of my favorites um, ever. So, like, I definitely recommend that if you're into that kind of thing, um, I, I, kind I, of mafia I, related. I, I, <laughs> don't I think it's on Netflix though. No, I was just saying, um, just general. Oh yeah. I put up my hand here, Jake, and I've never watched The Sopranos. Of course, I've heard about it. Um, yeah. I did get to break in bed last year and we binged on it in, in a couple of weeks, I'd say <laughs> two or three months. And it was absolutely brilliant. Um, we're kind of in, on Better Call Saul at the moment. Um, takes a oh bit yeah, to, I haven't watched that. It takes a bit to get into it in, in terms of like Breaking Bad was just probably the best of the best. But Sopranos is on my list too, like I said. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bit embarrassing, my, my <laughs> list of what I haven't watched so far. Um, so looking ahead, so to... Potentially, like we said, we hope it, it, it's a big, big year for, for skibbering rowing. Have you talked amongst yourselves the possibility of if one gets there and the other doesn't, how, how you'll deal with that? I know you you have a great relationship in a way and you've um, you pumped through the ranks together. But let's say Jake gets there and Fintan doesn't or vice versa. How, how do you deal with that as, as brothers, as twins? Well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, like it's not, we haven't sat down and talked about it or anything, but I think... You know, it doesn't really need to be said. Obviously, we'll be delighted for, you know, one another if, if they, if they, you know, achieve their goal. Um, a bit disappointed that it wasn't you, obviously, but, you know, that's the way it goes. So I think I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't hold it against him or anything. Mm. I think as well, like whoever kind of ends up in it um like whoever like say i'm not or finn's not or something who like whoever's not will have like a huge amount of respect i suppose and appreciation for the people that do get in it because like you know we're all so tight-knit and all so close and stuff like that and it's like i don't know you kind of have to applaud um the, the efforts of the other people you know because it's at such a high level um so i think i think it'll be like 
if ever when everyone gives their best, I don't think really there's any there's any bad blood, whatever happens. Yeah, right. like you're either good enough or you aren't. So And there was some good news late in twenty twenty, late last year, that lightweight rowing will be kept for the next Olympics after Tokyo, which is the Paris Olympics. And that came like a bolt from the blue for everyone. I think we're all expecting yeah. that, that lightweight rowing was going to be done and dusted from the Olympics. So there is another Olympic cycle there to look for. So Jake, when that news came true, so when you heard mm-hmm. that there's not going to be another Olympics with lightweight rowing, how much of a boost was that? Oh, that was, yeah, it was massive, to be honest, just because it kind of took a, a lot of pressure off as well, you know, just in relation to the injury. Um, like, say, I come back too soon, uh, push too hard, and then, uh, you know, I could, I could my, mess up my back even further for life, you know. Um, so I guess it's kind of just taking the pressure off that way that it's not like the last chance. Um, so it's definitely been a positive in that sense, yeah. Does it affect And also, obviously, um, more, more worlds and more, more rowing and more racing. <laughs> that almost preempts my next question, Fintan, because does it almost change your plans for, I'm not sure what your plans were for life after these Olympics, what you were whether you were going to stay at the top level of rowing or what, where life was going to take you. But has it changed your plans where you're going to think, OK, there's another Olympics there. Let's give it another four years and see what happens. Um, I'm not really one for planning. So I didn't have many post-Tokyo plans anyway, but I suppose it has. You know, I think we're both young and have more improvements to make and more, you know, seconds to gain. So I think, why not? go for it if we're fit and healthy um you know it's not everyone gets to follow their dreams I suppose the way we can so I think it would be a shame to waste it obviously we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow let alone four years down the line but that's that's my thoughts on it anyway so I had to completely change my plans anyway (laughs) I was I was stressed when I got the news at first (laughs) I was like, oh no, like I'm going to have to spend so much time rejigging the next three years. Because, you know, I planned to say do a master next year and then start work or whatever. But now it's just like, oh God, that's another three years later. And then you're thinking, will we starting work later? And is there less opportunities here and there and whatnot? But obviously now we have a lot more time to figure that out as well. So um, yeah, like Rowan's always been number one and the dream. So like, I think that'll always, in the end, you know, take priority over everything else um, when all said and done, really. No, it's fantastic news. And I think, like I said, we're all, it came out of left field. We're all kind of, it was a great surprise to get for everyone. Yeah, it was very it, like the best Christmas present that Irish lightweight rowers could have got because it's just, yeah. we, we thought rowing was gone and, and, it's, and it's still there. So, um, you know, like I said, potentially, lads, it's a, it's a huge year for both of you. I'm going to wish you the... The very best of luck. We'll, we'll keep in touch. We'll be back. We'll have you yeah. back on the podcast at, at some point in, in the next couple of months. And um, touch wood, everything goes well for Tokyo in the summer. Yeah, hopefully. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast, number one for sport in West Cork. Welcome back to the Star Sport Podcast. And before we wrap up, as always, we're going to preview this week's Southern Star Sports section. And it's a big one this week here. We have a very special feature that readers can look forward to don't we yeah and this is our 21 under 21 jack so basically what we're doing we are profiling 21 young local talented west cox sports people under the age of 21 that we think are worth keeping an eye on this is spread over five pages so it's quite a big feature and it's in association with clona milk as well who've come on board and with us for 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 this special so all across West Cork, we've looked and we've scoured and we've found what we think are 21 of the very top local talents. So they're coming from, from rugby to soccer to Gaelic football to camogie to motorsport to kickboxing, athletics. It's all in there. And there's some really top talents in there, Jack. With some really, really good young local sports people. So for anyone who has an interest in West Cork sport and anyone who's an interest in sport in general, I'd encourage you to get this Thursday Southern Star because you're getting a glimpse at the next generation. And like I said, we profile these young sports people. We tell you what makes them so special. We look at what they've coming up this year, what they've accomplished so far. So it really is a great, great reject. Absolutely. And 
if you can't make it to the, the shops this Thursday for any reason because of the current COVID restrictions, don't forget you can subscribe to the Southern Star online and read it on your computer, tablet or smartphone. Just go to www.southernstar.ie forward slash e paper. And just a final reminder as well that we'll be releasing another podcast this Wednesday. It's going to be a special tribute to Cork Ladies Management legend Eamon Ryan. We're going to be joined by Nulla Cleary and Rena Buckley Kieran. And just to give people a taster of what we can expect, just maybe set us up. How big an impact did Eamon Ryan have on ladies football in Cork and in Ireland even? I suppose there's two ways of looking at Eamon Ryan, Jack. You look at him as as the man outside of football and then the man involved in football and GA. And I suppose what he did for ladies football is... And I put up a tweet over the weekend where back in 2004, when he was brought on, um, brought into the Cork Ladies football setup in the Southern Star, it was a news tucked away in the bottom left-hand corner of a page. Um, and that was at a time when the Cork Ladies football team did one nothing, to be quite honest. But within, by the time he retired in 2015 from the Cork Ladies football team, they'd won 10 on Ireland in 11 years. I think they'd won 10 months of championships, nine national leagues, something like that, which is absolutely incredible. So... The transformative effect that he had on Cork Ladies football is absolutely incredible. And anyone who wants to get an insight into that, Mary White has a brilliant book, um, Relentless, she brought out a couple of years ago, which is a fascinating insight into the Cork Ladies football journey and a fascinating insight into Eamon Ryan and how he worked as well. But not alone did he transform Cork Ladies football, but I think as well he transformed ladies football because all of a sudden, because of that great Cork team, which stands against any other great GA teams over the years. You see ladies football now get more coverage than they ever did before. Ladies, the Cork ladies footballers were getting front page of national newspapers the Monday morning after they won North Ireland. So Eamon Ryan did absolutely incredible things for for Cork football and for football in general. Even his his approach to coaching and his approach to players was was incredible. And I hope to dig into that with, with Rena and Nolik in our special coming up later this week. So that's one not to be missed because Eamon Ryan was as Rina Buckley said already, he was one in a million and we hope to do tribute to the man this week in our second podcast. Lovely stuff, Kieran. Well, thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast. We'll be back, as we said, on Wednesday with that special tribute to Eamon Ryan. If you enjoy these shows, please make sure to rate, review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Slán Tommel. Thanks for listening to the Star Sport Podcast. Number one for sport in West Cork.